Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really a privilege to be uh, moderating this panel, uh, rather eminent panel, actually. And thanks, Nicholas, uh, and thanks, Capital Link, for the opportunity to moderate uh, this panel. Uh, so I have a very brief presentation to just set the uh, background of the uh, panel discussion. But before uh, I do the presentation, uh, may I have a very quick self-introduction uh, by the panelists, uh, maybe beginning with uh, Karekos. Hi, good day to everyone. Um, uh, again, thanks to Capital Link, thanks to Nicolas for the invitation. Uh, we ourselves, as many of you in here, residing in Singapore, we are very pleased that we see this, uh, this forum become a success story, becoming an annual event, and that's uh, quite pleasing. Uh, with regards to myself, um, I'm coming from the, uh, from the Shell group of companies with uh, uh, many companies in, in many segments of the shipping. In particular, I'm involved in the multi-purpose uh, specialized heavy lift uh, sector. Uh, the reason I'm on this panel, uh, we have uh, 24 years of experience dealing with Southeast Asia. This is one of our core markets uh, for our company. Over the years, we, we transferred and we transported uh, millions and millions of, of, of dry cargos uh, in, uh, in all commodities, uh, including uh, heavy lift, uh, over-dimensional cargos, bulk, uh, even containers at times when the container market was good. So we have extensive, extensive experience with uh, Southeast Asia, a region that is, is, is really, really promising for the future as well. Thank you. Charles? Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you for welcoming us here today. Um, I'm the chairman and CEO of Epic Gas. Uh, we're headquartered here in Singapore with offices in Manila and London and Tokyo. Uh, we move uh, LPG and pet chems on a global basis, but uh, significantly also in Southeast Asia. And my job as a CEO, I guess, is to provide safe, high quality services to our customers on a global basis. And I'm very well supported here in Singapore by a strong team in our head office. Uh, hand over to uh, Martin. Matt. Thank you. Um, I'm Martin Wade. I'm the CEO of Grinrod Shipping Holdings, which trades under two divisions, Island View Shipping which has 35 uh, Handys, Supermax, Ultramax, and Unicorn Tankers, which has nine MRs. Uh, we're Singapore domiciled. Uh, we listed on the NASDAQ, was a spin-off from our parent company in uh, June last year. And uh, we have a 40-year track record on the, on the dry side, a 70-year track record on the earning side, trading internationally. And as an owner, just to, I can't resist it, my colleague says, we are not a believers in scrubbers. <laughs> Thank you. Yasin. Thank you. Um, Yasin Anwar. Um, I'm the non-shipping expert on this panel, so I'm the token um, illiterate person. Uh, but nevertheless, my uh, uh, background is more in the banking field, corporate banking. I started in um, Chase Manhattan Bank called J.P. Morgan Chase in New York. Worked then after that 15 years in Bank of America in Europe and the United States. Um, only had one shipping loan that I made in my, my youthful years. From the private sector, I moved on to the, um, become a regulator as a uh, Central Bank of Pakistan, where I um, spent seven years and became a governor of the Central Bank and formed policy decisions. And now I'm back to the private sector, where uh, I was asked by the Industrial Commercial Bank of China to become their advisor out of Singapore and a couple of other places. So I do a little bit of um, strate strategic guidance to the bank in terms of where they should be doing business and how to regulate the industry, which is, of course, after the global financial crisis has become quite a challenge for everybody in different global markets. So I'm delighted to be here and we're glad to contribute to some of the input for the shipping industry. Thank you. Great, thank you. So as you can see, we really have a great panel out here, uh, uh, which will talk about what are the opportunities in this region. Uh, so before we set out, a uh, very quick introduction to the region. Uh, what you see here in the line chart is the uh, growth in the regional GDP of ASEAN countries. And largely in about six, seven years, the GDP has actually been well above 4.5%. Uh, there is a bit of, uh, uh, you see a 
moderate growth that we expect in 2019. And that uh, moderate growth is probably uh, mainly spurred by the moderation in trade. And uh, to an extent, uh, also the impact of uh, US-China uh, trade spat, which we will hear about a little bit later. But if you look at the uh, next four or five years expectations, uh, the expectation is that the growth rate will remain well above 5%. Uh, so that's a very healthy growth rate uh, uh, for the region. Uh, so what you see, uh, a cobweb here, a little bit of a cobweb, uh, which is showing you the inflation of various economies. So most of these economies has, uh, have had the inflation of about 4% or, low, uh, or lesser. Uh, and inflation of about 4%, I would say, is moderate. Uh, and I think Yasin can go on for hours and hours and tell you that a modest dose of inflation is uh, healthy for the economies. Uh, what you see here is uh, the growth in the trade uh, uh, in the ASEAN. As you can see, uh, there has been a massive growth, uh, say, in 2000, from about uh, $700 billion to about $2.5 billion in 2017, roughly uh, the growth of about, six point, uh, about 7 to 7.5% uh, per annum. Uh, and if you look at some of the other key factors which uh, has affected or which has really led to the massive development in this region, uh, the, the whole, all these uh, about 10 economies are well above uh, a three, mil, a three trillion dollar economy actually. Uh, the, the Fund Act investment today has reached about 137 billion dollars, uh, has a very uh, a good population of about 650 billion people if you look at the economies of uh, this region, Singapore uh, remains uh, second most competitive economy in the world. In terms of ease of doing business, again, Singapore is second. Uh, and if you look at uh, risk rating, uh, Singapore has, uh, you can say, nearly no risk uh, as such. Uh, and other economies also has a very uh, low risk. <clears throat> and most of these economies have really been improving over the years in terms of their risk profile or in terms of competitiveness. And certainly English is the prime language and official language of ASEAN, which uh, is a critical element in, in, in the growth of trade uh, and, and the development. Uh, so with this, I <coughs> close my presentation and I'll start with uh, the questions to the panel. Uh, <coughs> and the first question that I would like to pose is, uh, what are the opportunities you see uh, in terms of in this region? Uh, maybe beginning with uh, Karikos? I think your presentation just says it all. Um, here in, in Southeast Asia, we have um, all the fundamentals in place. I think all the landscape here with, uh, with regards to certain key areas are in place, and uh, that ensures uh, future growth. We have seen in your presentation that there is a steady, steady growth coming up. Uh, we have seen that uh, there is massive uh, foreign investments uh, in this region. Uh, we see that uh, the increasing ease of, of doing business in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, I would add also that uh, it, uh, Southeast Asia is getting more prepared. They've done a lot of, of, of work on the, on the political front. They came across to a number and various uh, trade agreements, which uh, sets the pace again for, for future growth. And they have been uh, well, well uh, uh, prepared for that. With the upcoming uh, uh, worldwide uh, events uh, taking place, they now come into a stage where they have a significant uh, impact as well as contribution to the global economy. They're in the crossroads of the main trade lanes. And uh, if you look into specific uh, vertical industry sectors, uh, whichever you point, whether this is oil and gas, whether this is uh, mining, uh, uh, commodity trading, whether this is uh, manufacturing, whether this is infrastructure, construction, uh, financial services, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a booming, uh, it's a booming market over the last years, and uh, I think uh, the positive uh, sentiment is still there. So uh, whichever industry sector you see, everybody will witness that, uh, yeah, Southeast Asia is it's their primary market, it's their 
is their core market in certain areas, and uh, it's, it's there to continue. So uh, I have mentioned those uh, industry sectors uh, uh, becoming, uh, uh, becoming uh, trading uh, opportunity for the, for the long run as well. Thank you. Charles? Thank you. Uh, please uh, let me indulge you for a few minutes by just talking around uh, LPG and what that means uh, in the region. So on a global basis, maybe to wind back up a bit, uh, global LPG seaborne trade uh, is around 100 million tonnes this year. It will pass 100 million tonnes. If we wind back five years, it was maybe 70 million tonnes. So global growth has been substantial, and that's been on the back of increased oil and natural gas exploration, LPG being distinct from LNG, but coming from the same place. If we look uh, regionally, uh, any country we choose to pick in, in the region around Southeast Asia has seen distinct demand growth for LPG over the time frame as well. And that's varied from uh, 4 to 12 percent on average in, in a number of the nearby economies on a year to year. But each country each year is vying for the record growth. And uh, for instance, the award last year went to Bangladesh where we saw 70 percent growth in one year where increased imports, uh, imports went from 500,000 tonnes to 850,000 tonnes in one year. Uh, generally speaking, on short sea, smaller short sea vessels, typical to those that are run by Epic Gas. Uh, if we then sort of also look at what else has been going on in the region from the size of ships that are used, we've seen uh, increasing ship sizes. So if we wind back again three, four years, only a short space of time, uh, we typically run 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, and 11,000 cubic meter vessels, so the full spectrum of smaller gas ships. Uh, three, four years ago, there were no larger vessels trading in Asia whatsoever. There were no 7,000, no 11,000 cubic meter vessels. Right now, one third of the global fleet is actually trading in Asia in 30 different ports. So there's been significant investment taking place in Southeast Asian countries, whether that's Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, and so on. And uh, that's enabled uh, larger volumes of LPG to be delivered. LPG, I should have said, of course, is primarily used in cooking, heating, auto gas, uh, small scale power plant projects. It's ideally suited to a lot of the countries in the region because it's easy to deliver in bottle form to uh, rural or remote communities and it's cheaper to deliver than LNG. Um, so, so from our point of view, we've seen significant uh, investment into smaller ports, significant growth in LPG demand, and we believe that the future, especially built on the slides you've just shown us, uh, Jay, is, is strong. Yeah, thank you. Martin, you're a <coughs> South African company. I mean, uh, origin is South Africa. So how, how do you see the opportunities in this region? Well, fr from a dry cargo perspective, it's very much about coal, to be honest. It's Indonesia, 428 million tons of exports last year, 120 million tons to China, 71 million tons to other Southeast Asian economies, also now shipping uh, a couple of million tons growing to Pakistan. It is phenomenal how important Indonesia is and the coal. And then you tag onto that Philippines, 30 million tonnes of, of nickel ore going out a year. Malaysia just uh, lifted their mining ban. Indonesia, close on 15 million tonnes of nickel ore last year. It's a hugely important area. Yes, you're right. We then kind of include South Africa, Middle East, India. Again, the whole area is, is coal, it's minerals. Uh, South Africa, obviously exporting coal, the uh, an industry that used to export to, to Europe is now predominantly targeting India and Pakistan. Uh, manganese ore, Chinese manganese ore imports in January hit 3 million tons for the first time. And it's interesting, the whole dry bulk market at the moment, in terms of the minor bulks, obviously there's been issues with iron ore and coal, but if you take the minor bulks of copper conchs, nickel ore, bauxite, coking coal, all of them up were between 23 and 28 percent year on year in January, February. So in the minor bulks, th 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 there is no issue. Um, it appears to be in the major bulks and maybe confidence. But the whole potential, yes, a lot of it revolves around China. But when, when you take, uh, what do we got? You've got Vietnamese uh, coal imports up 12 million tonnes last year alone. Vietnam, uh, sorry, Thailand at 25 million. 
This is a, a very interlinked area. A lot will depend on, on China, but each country is growing, and it's, it's the basic raw materials that, uh, that we ship on, on, on the smaller sizes are hugely important. So Yasin, uh, you are uh, <clears throat> really at the heart of Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, I guess there cannot be any uh, more qualified person than you to really talk about it. So what do you see in terms of Belt and Road Initiative? What opportunities does it bring uh, in Southeast Asia? Okay, thank you. Well, Martin touched on a couple of points that are very valid. Uh, explain how the Belt and Road Initiative uh, fits into this. Um, since the global financial crisis I mentioned, there's been a sea change uh, shift in terms of where the trade flows will be. Uh, and in terms of the Western Hemisphere and the growth rates in Asia, and particularly ASEAN region. As we all know, I won't uh, repeat them because you touched on Jay uh, already, is the growth rates in Asia will be where the future will be. ASEAN population, as you mentioned earlier, is about 600 plus uh, million, and that is the third largest market in, um, in this region after China and India. The Belt Road Initiative is a $3 trillion effort that encompasses that comprises of 70 countries, 65% of the GDP, and about 40% of the global trade. Uh, this particular uh, uh, effort uh, will give you a highlight of how the resources are going to be spread out with leveraging multilateral availability. The private equity, for example, has about 50 billion available, but only $1 billion has been allocated because there are most of the transactions are not bankable. Now, in terms of the few China has touched on earlier how it will be a pivotal player. Uh, if you look at 1980 to 2016, the growth rates of the world were about 3.5%. If you take China out of the equation, it was only 2.7%. Even China slowing down to about 6.2% for a $13.5 trillion economy grows faster than a 10% rate for a $2 trillion economy. That's simple math. So in terms of this region itself, uh, one has to look at ASEAN region where an increase in trade took place by about 12%. But intra-regional trade is very important. And that is only about 24%. Unlike NAFTA and Europe, which is about 57 to 63%. This needs a correction, and that's the direction it will take place. BRI, Belt Road Initiative, uh, is an effort that focuses on infrastructure. Infrastructure is the backbone of the economy. ASEAN region, at the moment, is primarily SME-driven. Thailand and Vietnam are 90% registered companies, 99% are SMEs. In the case of infrastructure, urbanization in ASEAN region is only about 40%. The international standard is about 60%. Singapore, of course, is uh, much higher, up close to 90% plus. But what is going to happen between now and 2050? ASEAN region is expected to be at the range of about 60%. Where is that going to come from? That's going to come from infrastructure. That's the backbone of this particular BRI effort. And it's all about connectivity. You've got projects in Indonesia. You've got Bangladesh. The four largest recipients of the BRI initiative are one, Pakistan, touched on by Martin, at 63 billion. Second is Bangladesh at 38 billion. Malaysia at 34 billion. And Philippines at 31 billion. Now, I could go on about each of those countries, but that'll take a long time. But this gives you an idea how the Belt and Road Initiative is going to support this effort. The 40% of the world trade goes through the Indian Ocean. By 2030, 90% of the Middle East oil is going to flow through to the, the uh, ASEAN region. Uh, there are many, many other trade flows that will take place intra-regionally and with the supply chains that are going to be readjusted because of harmonization and cost-effective reasons. Manufacturing is going to benefit out of this as well. So all of these areas, and I don't want to go too long, We'll touch on a little bit more on your second round of questions. But this gives you a flavor about how the intra-regional trade in ASEAN and the region in Asia itself is going to benefit from BRI. Thank you. Um, would any one of you want to focus on BRI and its impact on your respective sectors? Uh, Karikos, do you want to? Yeah, if I, if I make a special reference on our sector, uh, we, are, we are really pleased to see the infrastructure coming down. As, uh, Yasin mentions this BRI initiative, uh, the Bed Road Initiative, 
what brings into this uh, into this region is, is massive uh, infrastructure projects, and that uh, that involves again uh, along uh, along many many industry sectors. I mean, uh, from from uh, rails and into port infrastructure, into into even uh, oil and gas, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, other constructions and manufacturing. Uh, we are in the specialized uh, heavy lift sector. We have placed already uh, uh, quite significant fleet around uh, around the area. Uh, as I said before, this is in the crossroads of all our trade lanes, and we have put in place already uh, a number of, of various service models, including liner schedules, including uh, semi-liner and uh, uh, tram chartering to tailor. Uh, uh, for tailor-made voyages in place, and uh, we have been uh, quite uh, quite active in this region. Uh, infrastructure is one main main uh, focus for the heavy lift industry, and it has been our bread and butter over the last uh, the last years. So Charles, have you seen its impact on your industry? Yeah, uh, w whenever I sit down with our customers, uh, we're very involved in the intra-movement uh, of cargo, the intra-regional movement of cargo, which is what Yassim was referring to at one point, I think. And uh, we're doing about uh, an average sea voyage is around about six days for us. We're doing 2,700 port calls a year on a fleet of 40 ships. So it's a very intensive intra-regional trade. And whenever we talk to our customers, they've all got uh, our projects, plans, ideas for investment in new terminals, uh, expansion, distribution, bottling plants, supply chains. So it's a very exciting time. And it's also good to hear that some of the projects aren't necessarily going to get past the hurdle for investment because you want them to be controlled and delivered in a way that's successful for the long term. Uh, but uh, if we look at the region as a whole also, we've also seen an increase in transshipment operations, for instance, where big ships are brought into the region to uh, take the heavy lift, if you like, on the miles. And uh, then uh, the smaller vessels are involved in regional distribution, so I haven't spoke. So we've seen uh, the sector, the LPG sector in, in Southeast Asia, we've seen a significant increase from almost zero of our operations four to five years ago being transshipment to around about 18% of them being in a transshipment methodology these days. So that's taking LPG from big ships into small ships to get them into the smaller ports uh, which are typical for the region. Martin? Absolutely critical for the, uh, to be honest with the future of shipping. Uh, if we ever get to get another good market, it, it's important that the Belt Road Initiative does survive as a, we talked about Pakistan, sunny uh, coal-fired power stations out of nowhere. But it's not without issues, as we've seen with Sri Lanka, where Sri Lanka lost a port because it couldn't afford the terms. We've now seen with the Maldives, where a change of government has also looked at the terms and has balked at paying. Vietnam has declined. So hugely important. However, I think what countries have to do now is just look at the small print and make sure they can afford to do it. From an overall perspective, I say fantastic, but I think what we're seeing now is it, it, it comes with terms, conditions attached, and, and maybe in some ways it has to be rethought ju just a little bit if it is going to be th the, the success that we need. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, what we see is, of course, there has been an increasing globalization, despite that there have been also talk about anti-globalization as well. Uh, but uh, we do see that the U.S.-China trade war has led to... Um, uh, moderation in growth rate uh, at a lot of places, and it seems it may be uh, coming into Southeast Asia as well. So uh, would you feel that there is uh, going to be any positive or a negative impact of U.S.-China trade war, Karikos? U.S.-China uh, tensions, I think it has uh, both negative and, and positive impact on, uh, on Asian countries. I mean, U.S. and, and uh, China are the first biggest two major partners of the area. So any slowdown in either, in either or both coming from, from these uh, tensions will have definitely a direct impact on the economies of, of Southeast Asian nations. Uh, on the other side, uh, um, I have the tend to, to see you more on the positive side. So I think the positive, uh, it's, it's much more than the negative, and I will explain that why. I think this is the opportunity also for the uh, Southeast Asian nations to take the uh, to grasp that uh, opportunity, 
because if this uh, goes, goes further, it could, they could offer an alternative part, or rather a, a backup plan uh, for both of these uh, nations, uh, US and China, whereby uh, you will see Southeast Asian uh, goods replacing Chinese goods in, in US market, and uh, you will see uh, Southeast Asian goods replacing American goods in, the, in China market. So that's, uh, that's, that's coming into, into a real positive uh, promising uh, uh, consequence, I would say. That uh, will also boost more manufacturing in order to, to, uh, to meet the, that demand coming from both uh, these huge giant economies. And uh, we expect to see also relocation of, of fabrication and manufacturing. Uh, I mean, US interest and Chinese interest uh, uh, will be <coughs> relocating their manufacturing plants into Southeast Asia in order to, to overcome that uh, uh, trade uh, tension. So this, in turn, will, uh, will boost further the economies of, of Southeast Asian nations. We will see the, those uh, developing into a self-sustained uh, 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 entity, and uh, of course, uh, it will also uh, uh, give uh, further growth to manufacturing for domestic demand, and that's becoming less dependent on the, on exports. So, hence, uh, it will be a, a much uh, more uh, uh, matured economy uh, and balanced economy for all these uh, Asian nations, and I think uh, it's coming. Because even if we see a solution coming shortly, uh, everybody uh, would take this as a short-term solution. And in the meantime, everybody will be looking into backup plans just in case of further future uh, threats coming up. So that would be, uh, so Southeast Asia would be the, the alternative part, would be the backup plan. I mean, there's no other region that can, uh, can do better than uh, Southeast Asia in terms of manufacturing, in terms of, of distribution of goods as well. Charles, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, from, from our very simplistic perspective, uh, we don't believe that President Trump really wants to harm global growth or harm his own economy. It's a negotiating position that will get wound out at some point in the next uh, few months. Uh, but uh, what we've seen on the ground, or on the water even, uh, at sea, is that propane imports to China, which were coming largely from North America, uh, instead coming from the Middle East, and, and that would appear to be a short-term change in ton mile uh, demand for the larger vessels. For the smaller vessels, Epic Gas ourselves, we're involved in the inter-regional movements. Uh, we've seen a steady demand, for instance, for pet chems, which we also carry on on our vessels into China, which would be supported by flat to steadily increasing propane imports to China. Uh, and we've also seen ongoing uh, demand growth for LPG in the surrounding countries around Singapore here anyway. So we haven't seen a slowdown in any form of growth in the region because of uh, the sanctions, the, the, sorry, the tariffs that have come in place uh, for China, US. Martin? Yeah, shipping, especially dry side, we, we run on sentiment. And, and this trade war has been, to be, to be blunt, a bit of a disaster. It has really not sentiment. Now, the Chinese have been very clever in terms of targeting soya beans, the only grain that wastes. But by dropping 8, 9 million tons of imports last year, the ton sea mile equation for, for the dry cargo Panamax and down has been a, a disaster. You can now take what they're doing to Australian coal. OK, they're making up with Indonesian coal, but the ton sea mile, as Charles says, we need ton sea miles. So this has to be resolved. Trump is a businessman. I'm convinced he'll do the greatest ever, ever, best, best, ever, ever trade deal at some point, <laughs> and I think the sentiment will improve. But at the moment, it, it, is, it is a problem. And I would like to think that Trump, with election coming up, he might even rope in some Chinese infrastructure spending in, in America. But I suspect that until this trade war does get resolved, China is slowing down. You can see Japanese exports to, to, to China slowing dramatically, Southeast Asian economies. We do need that, that fill up. And I know China has started infrastructure spending again. One would hope in the belief that a deal will be done. But shipping is a lot about com confidence and sentiment at the moment, especially on the dry side. We don't have it. Yasin, uh, do you see any impact of U.S.-China trade war on this part of the world? Well, I, I'm a bit of an optimist, and I see the glass half full. And, you know, economists, I should say respectable economists, uh, say that a trade war is, is an exercise in futility. You should have a win-win situation as opposed to a winner-loser situation. Larry Summers also says the same thing. 
So in my view, this is a short-term obstacle which will have its kinks in the armor smooth itself out long-term. I always define, having worked on Wall Street for a number of years, the definition in the United States of um, short-term is one year, whereas in China, I define short-term as five years. And that's the way certainty will be more fruition. Keep in mind, the President of the United States is there for four years. He's only got two years left. He's got these policies that may change. A new election is going to be around the corner. President Xi Jinping is there for a lot longer term, life. So you've got an ele element of policies that will continue in the same framework, there, so therefore there's an element of certainty. Uh, Martin, uh, Martin touched on a couple of points which are very important. He mentioned about coal, and yes, the reason why Pakistan has got this uh, demand all of a sudden from Indonesia and South Africa is two $1 billion coal-fired power plants were supposed to be go up and go up under this BRI initiative. The target rate was about 36 months. It was completed in less than uh, four months short of that. Several uh, alternative energy power plants have also gone up, but coal is being imported from South Africa and Indonesia. That's an increasing pattern. Africa is another area. Last year, 170 billion trade took place between Africa and China, a 14% increase. Up to end of last year, it was up by 20%. Just to highlight about this BRI again, today, China represents the number one exporter, part export partner for more than 75 countries compared to only two countries 20 years back. That's the sea change that is taking place. More than 40, I'll be attending a BRI conference uh, in about three weeks' time in Beijing that's hosted by President Xi Jinping. Over 40 heads of states are going to be attending that. Again, that is an impetus that most countries desire. Why? Because some of these countries under the BRI initiative are short of resources. The resources are not coming out of the Western Hemisphere, Europe or the United States, because banks under the uh, regulatory controls are somewhat risk averse. They don't have the capital to commit to long-term projects. Chinese institutions do, and the BRI supports that. That resource base, I compared to uh, a fellow Wharton alumni, and Donald Trump went to the same school, but he graduated by the time I got there. Uh, but Don, uh, Milken, Junk Pond King, came up with a great product to access, allow access to junk bond or below investment grade companies that trapped cash and could not ac access capital to build up their resources. That was a great product that spread into the industry uh, in, in a wide array of products. Same thing BRI, analogous to that, I say, has a resource base to allow countries that are not investment grade, who don't have access to capital with the euro bond market because they're below investment grade, to tap the markets for this resource, to, to fuel their economy, fuel the infrastructure, to create employment, and for inclusive growth. That's where it's going to come from, from these countries. And I can't understand, I can't fathom why anybody would want to halt that particular effort, because it helps grow up, grow the emerging markets, will generate the jobs as well as the demand for products to increase the uh, shipping flows that are obviously in demand. Duisburg in Germany, 80% of the trains that go from China go to Duisburg. Why? Because the largest in inland port that is structured for, for Europe. Last year, Piraeus processed four million containers alone to distribute to the uh, various uh, ports around the, in the European area. Dubai itself has 4,500 4, companies registered in, from China in the UAE. Pakistan has over 500. So this is a shift that I don't think any trade war is going to be able to, to stop this joke or not. So I, I'm optimistic towards this, and I feel there'll be opportunities for shipping that'll come out from this. Thank you. So we just have about a minute and a half left. So may I open a uh, uh, floor for questions? If you have any questions, please raise your hands. Okay, if not, then a uh, very quick question, and just in few words, actually. So do you see any uh, risks to uh, opportunities here in Southeast Asia? Uh, beginning with Yasin, uh, in, uh, very briefly, because we don't have time. Well, the risk I see is that those shippers and other investors uh, ignore and disregard the BRI initiative and the ASEAN opportunities that do exist going forward. The ASEAN region, by 2050, will be one of the four largest economic trading blocks in the world. So therefore, the risk is not being in as opposed to being a participant and active in this BRI initiative that connects these countries that are recipients of these infrastructure development programs. 
Okay, that's interesting. Okay, anybody else? Would you want to comment on the risk uh, of uh, being of opportunities here in Southeast Asia? Uh, I think there's, like anywhere in the world, there's the geopolitical risk of countries falling out with each other uh, over the, uh, sort of a feeling like they should rush to invest uh, to chase a BRI investment of some form or another, and and secondly that the BRI investments are are, are not assessed correctly and made in a in a proper financial way. So they okay. can give a long-term return and uh, so on, on on the region they're investing in. Thank you. Um, any other comment, Martin or Karikos? It's fine. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. So as you can see, there are uh, this. You are sitting in the region with great opportunities. So welcome.